nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this short course on uh, uh, stochastic computing. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, magnetic tunnel junction as a stochastic device that's potentially useful in doing computations like uh, you know, stochastic uh, neural networks uh, for Bayesian inferencing and in optimization problems where one can potentially get stuck in a local minima and such uh, stochasticity can take you out of the local minima into uh, a region that can give you a uh, good optimized uh, solution to those problems. Uh, myself, I'm Koshik Roy. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering at Purdue University, uh, along with uh, my colleague Abhinil Sengupta, who is a uh, professor at uh, Penn State, who will be talking about giving you an overview of uh, magnetic tunnel junction and how it can be used for uh, stochastic uh, computing. Now, uh, just to get started, let me first talk about uh, magnetic tunnel junctions. In general, magnetic tunnel junctions uh, tunnel junctions consist of uh, a nanomagnet, two nanomagnets separated by a spacer. In this particular case, what I'm showing here is that there are two nano nanomagnets. One nanomagnet is a fixed nanomagnet. The other one is a, it's called a free one, meaning thereby that you might actually be able to change the configuration of that magnet. So I'm showing these two nanomagnets and uh, the configurations of these uh, magnets are, in one case, it's a parallel configuration. The other case, it's an anti-parallel configuration. Uh, turns out that if one measures the resistance between uh, these two con uh, devices, uh, one of the devices with a parallel configuration has a resistance which is lower than the anti-parallel configuration. Now, that uh, you know, since these devices have uh, two states, parallel and, and anti-parallel, they can potentially be used in uh, memories. Now let's uh, think about the stability of each of those magnets. There's uh, something called, a, uh, uh, each magnet has something called a barrier height or the energy barrier uh, of the magnet, which basically tells me how easy it is going to be to switch the magnet from one configuration to the other configuration. The uh, stability or that uh, um, uh, <coughs> barrier height of the magnet is actually related to what's called the uh, is the volume of the magnet, and also it depends on the, what's called the anisotropy of the magnet. Huh? Now it turns out if you are able to actually make the volume to be smaller, or some ways if you're able to scale the barrier height, it turns out that uh, it's going to be easy to switch the magnet. And, uh, to, uh, and if you're really talking about going down to a barrier height, which is very, very low, um, down to about uh, 1 kT uh, or so, you'll find out that you have a sto spontaneous switching of those magnets. Now, such spontaneous switching is can be potentially useful in some applications, but when you're looking at, for example, memory applications and so on, the barrier height is usually kept high enough, uh, uh, about of the order of about 40 to 60 kT. Uh, however, for logic applications, such a barrier height is, uh, and a high barrier height may not be required, and uh, you know, people usually talk in terms of having uh, barrier heights of the order of about 25 to 30 kT. Uh, and uh, you know, for a lot of these applications that we're talking about, stochastic computing applications, um, uh, turns out that you can uh, certainly go to lower barrier heights to about 20 to 25 kT to have a reliable, so to say, operation of these stochastic uh, uh, computing devices. And uh, that's what we can be focusing on next. Hmm? Now, as I mentioned, appropriate choice of the barrier height is required depending on the kind of applications that you're looking at. Now, uh, going into a little more details of uh, the magnetic tunnel junctions, uh, this shows some interesting uh, switching behavior. Uh, again, let's look at uh, this magnetic tunnel junction uh, with, uh, uh, with the spacer in between, which is a magnesium oxide. And it turns out that uh, what I'm showing uh, below right here is uh, if you're applying a current or a current pulse through these magnetic tunnel junction, shown there with a, if you're trying to write uh, into that device, uh, the writing, it turns out, is actually stochastic in nature. Meaning thereby that, uh, um, you know, if you apply a current pulse, depending on the magnitude of the current pulse versus, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the y-axis I'm plotting the switching probability, uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, depending on the current that you apply, there's a probability of switching associated with it, right? For example, for this particular device, 
if I apply a certain amount of current, if, I'm, uh, if that current is right here, then the probability that you're able to switch the magnet from, uh, you know, let's say parallel to anti-parallel state uh, is uh, probabilistic or having a probability of, let's say, less than one, let's say about 0.5 right here. Now, if your current is large enough, uh, it turns out then, uh, then the, having a probability, uh, uh, you know, turns out to be much higher. And here you're probably seeing a probability of 99 or 99.99 to switch that magnet. And when you're using this device for memory applications, it's absolutely necessary when you write it into that device, uh, uh, the device shows uh, uh, <coughs> A deterministic switching behavior. However, for the applications that we'll be looking at, we'll be looking at is uh, uh, the curves right here, which are uh, in the probabilistic regime, right? So uh, all our uh, analysis later on is going to be, uh, you know, for magnets, which are going to be in that probabilistic switching regime. Now, uh, interestingly, um, uh, if you look at this magnetic tunnel junction, uh, there are some inefficiencies that come into picture. The writing is actually difficult. So more recently, people have looked at uh, having a magnetic tunnel junction which sits on um, uh, top of a, a heavy metal. In this particular case, the heavy metal could be uh, a platinum or tantalum. Uh, and uh, the switching in this particular case is actually not through the magnetic tunnel junction, but having a current flowing through these heavy metal. The switching is sometimes referred to as a spin orbit torque switching. Um, and uh, the basic idea, the basic phenomena that comes into picture is that a spin hall effect, where you have a current flowing through this heavy metal as shown there. And if the current flows in one direction, uh, it, one can show that you're going to switch the nano magnet, which is in connection with the heavy metal in one direction versus if the current flows in the other direction, uh, turns out the switching is going to be in the opposite direction. Or, and, the, and as you can imagine, the, uh, the fixed layer is on top. Uh, the, uh, the free layer is on the bottom, and one can potentially now measure uh, whether you have uh, switching in the nanomagnet by, uh, you know, having a uh, read current going through the magnet to determine whether it's in the parallel or in the anti-parallel state. Now, right below that, what I'm showing here is some of the experiments that we did on, um, uh, again, a magnet with a under layer, which is a heavy metal, and trying to show that indeed what we show on the right the measurement results that the switching behavior uh, is stochastic in nature. And, and, and if you look carefully again, uh, the switching behavior looks somewhat like um, a, a sigmoid function. Or in other words, uh, if you are to really think about uh, the behavior of this magnet, that magnet behaves as a, uh, uh, as a stochastic switching device with characteristics very similar to a uh, sigmoid kind of stochastic switching. Now, uh, there's been a good amount of work that has been going on on stochastic devices, and in particular, uh, using magnetic tunnel, tunnel junction as a stochastic device. Uh, the work started back in, uh, you know, I'm showing here back in 2014. There was a work done by Chris Kim at University of Minnesota where they actually used uh, this um, uh, magnetic tunnel junction uh, as a true random number generator. Uh, following that work, there was some work done in uh, uh, in uh, in Europe on stochastic uh, devices, uh, magnetic tunnel junction devices and stochastic switching of those devices. Uh, and uh, uh, following that, there was some work uh, in, back in 2015 uh, that was done in our group uh, along with uh, Professor Raghunathan, where we looked at the stochastic switching behavior of the magnets and used it in uh, stochastic logic. Uh, Later, um, you know, uh, following that, there's been work that's been going on on uh, stochastic uh, switching of these nanomagnets and using that for uh, uh, neurons and synapses, in particular, actually, using uh, self-learning uh, uh, in, in spiking neural networks. And that work was done in 2016, where the barrier height of the magnet was kept at about, you know, 20 to 25 kT, and the operations were done in a synchronous fashion. Now, following that, uh, there's been work which has been done on really lowering the magnet uh, barrier height to about, uh, you know, uh, close to zero kT or one kT, and uh, then looking at the um, spontaneous uh, uh, switching of those nanomagnets uh, and in using that uh, uh, to do spin logic or other forms of computing, Ising models and other forms of computing. Uh, interestingly enough, 
you know, when, and we'll go into more details of that. When you keep the barrier height to be too low, uh, the variations of these nanomagnets would come into picture, and that can potentially uh, change the, um, you know, the performance that you can get. And we'll talk about that later on. Uh, also, interestingly, if you keep the barrier height to be too low, it turns out it's going to be very, very difficult to read the magnet because the current going through the, uh, you know, the read current going through the magnetic tunnel junction can probably pin the, uh, you know, free layer. Now, following those work, there's been also work which has been going on on, uh, you know, uh, deep belief networks using, uh, in Professor Datta's group, uh, using uh, stochastic nanomagnets. And uh, more recently, uh, there's been some work which uh, has been done in our group looking at, uh, you know, comparative analysis of uh, using high and low barrier magnets for, uh, you know, uh, all these stochastic com computing applications. Now, on the other side of it, it's also uh, uh, good to put things into perspective. Uh, stochastic bits certainly are uh, useful and can be used using magnetic tunnel junctions. You know, using a single device, one can come up with this uh, biased random number generator, which is quite uh, interesting and, uh, you know, small in area. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, people have looked at using CMOS, uh, uh, to generate uh, stochastic behavior of, uh, uh, you know, uh, to have random number generators and biased random number generators. Um, in most of the CMOS cases, the number of transistors required is large. Uh, uh, however, uh, certainly one can, uh, you know, produce the functionality um, uh, of uh, the behavior that I showed earlier uh, using uh, the CMOS devices. Uh, on the left, what I'm showing here is a, a RAM device, uh, which is a, a resistive uh, filament-based device. Uh, and uh, turns out that you can use such devices also for uh, uh, stochastic uh, switching. Uh, there are several advantages and disadvantages that one can look at. Uh, turns out that uh, the main advantages of using RAMs um, would be that um, uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, one of the disadvantages that one can think of is that uh, uh, they are a high power uh, with reduced reliability. Uh, and uh, we'll see later on when we, you try to use these devices for um, uh, computing, um, uh, it turns out that you might need power-hungry uh, interface circuitry. Now, um, what I'm going to do now is uh, talk about uh, stochastic computing uh, in a little more details using uh, the device, which is basically the magnetic tunnel junction device, as shown here, as a core uh, building block for doing computations like, for example, neuromorphic computing. In this particular case, it's going to be stochastic neuromorphic computing. And on the other side of it, the same device. It, uh, and again, before I go into uh, other applications, it turns out that the same device, the magnetic tunnel junction, can be used for both neurons and synapses. Um, on the other side of it, if you really look at, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 computing uh, optimi or optimization problems, it turns out that uh, uh, these stochastic devices can also be quite useful as a natural annealer when it comes to, compu uh, you know, doing uh, stochastic uh, optimization problems. Uh, it can be also used for random walk uh, problem, uh, you know, and uh, uh, for satisfiability, solving satisfiability problems using random walk, and also can be uh, quite useful in uh, you know doing probabilistic inferencing, for example, uh, you know Bayesian uh, networks. So with uh, so the next sort of things that uh, we'll talk about is just to get started on uh, is on neuromorphic computing hmm? or stochastic neuromorphic computing. Now. Again, as I mentioned, the basic element for synapses and neurons that we're going to be using for these, uh, uh, for these uh, uh, computing, uh, it would be these stochastic bits, uh, which is the magnetic tunnel junction with the heavy metal shown here. Um, and these stochastic bits would act as really neurons and synapses. Um, in this slide, what I'm really showing is, on the left, a biological neural network, and on the right, uh, a corresponding artificial neural network. And I'm going to show you a very simplified model of uh, such an artificial ne neural network. The basic, uh, you know, that uh, our idea is to try to, uh, you know, mimic the brain as much as possible to do such comp computing and to be able to do, um, you know, uh, computing that 
for example, the human brain is really good at. Uh, for example, uh, recognition problems, visual recognition, uh, reasoning, uh, decision making, and so on. Now, uh, one obvious question that comes up is that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we have not really been able to achieve the efficiency of the brain with these kind of computing models yet. Uh, brain is really very, very efficient in doing, uh, as I said, uh, uh, you know, uh, recognition, reasoning, decision making, and so on. Uh, so the question, of course, is, uh, so where do these inefficiencies come from? Uh, uh, when we try to implement these, uh, you know, artificial neural networks uh, using CMOS technology, let's say, uh, where do these inefficiencies come from? The inefficiencies really come from the fact, for, from uh, you know, from various levels of abstraction. First of all, we are not really quite familiar with the algorithms in the brain. Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, there's a lot of work which is going on to make uh, algorithms which are bioplausible and to be able to actually uh, use that effectively uh, for uh, reducing the energy efficiency gap that exists today between the brain and the artificial networks. Secondly, we also don't know the computing architecture of the brain. And uh, for whatever little that we know, the computer arch architecture of the brain is possibly not like the von Neumann machine where you have memory on one side and the computing on the other side of things. Um, so there's a need for doing, uh, in some ways, what the brain does to be able to do some computing within the memory itself, and that in uh, something like in-memory computing, and that can be quite useful. Uh, finally, at the end of it, uh, we also don't have the biological neurons and synapses. So uh, in general, these are represented or implemented in terms of uh, you know, CMOS technologies and CMOS transistors, um, and they are usually not very efficient. So the question that we're going to be focusing on are the things that we're going to be looking at today are, is it possible to actually represent neurons and synapses in a very, very effective way using these magnetic tunnel junctions and uh, uh, to do, for example, computing and uh, in particular, actually stochastic uh, neural computing. So to go into a little more details of it, what I'm showing here is going to uh, try, let's try to understand each of those uh, blocks that are shown there in that artificial neural network, a simplified version of it to understand how things will fit in uh, with these new devices. So a simple uh, artificial neural network model uh, would really consist of having uh, a bunch of these inputs which are coming in, which are shown in terms of these input signals uh, in terms of spikes that might be coming in. And these spikes go into uh, synapses, which are given in terms of weights W1, W2, W3 to Wn. And uh, what the uh, neuron then does is it actually does some sort of a uh, weighted summation, which is the inputs multiplied by the weights, and they're summed up. And finally, the neuron fires depending on whether I have reached a certain threshold or not. And the thresholding function on the right that I'm showing here is really a kind of like a sigmoid function. And we'll see later on that that sigmoid is, we're going to be trying to replace that sigmoid with a stochastic sigmoid uh, representing, uh, represented with a magnetic tunnel junction. So again, um, uh, the basic operations that turns out to be important are these weighted summation operations, and the weighted summa summation operations can be done in a crossbar, and that crossbar can consist of, uh, you know, when we look at binary neural networks, that's what we're going to be doing today, uh, using, you uh, uh, know, crossbar of these uh, uh, magnetic tunnel junctions. And, uh, uh, and one can do these computations, the weighted summation computation. And following that, uh, what one can also do is really try to look at this thresholding functionality. And as I mentioned, the magnetic tunnel junction with the heavy metal can be quite well represented by uh, 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 to do this thres thresholding operation. Now, the next set of slides, we're going to be talking about how the MTG mimics the biological uh, spiking neuron. And I'm going to have uh, my colleague, uh, Abhrin Sengupta, to uh, take over from here. So now, here I will be talking about how we can use magnetic tunnel junction devices for, for performing biomimetic computations. Now, note the fact that when we are trying to implement these neuromorphic computing platforms, you are having almost 10,000 synapses per neuron. Therefore, it is very crucial to have a nanomagnetic device where you can inherently implement the functionalities by a single device operating at very low terminal voltages. If you are considering implementation of these computing platforms in CMOS technologies, for example, you will need 
a huge number of transistors just for implementation of a single neuron and synapse because you do not have a di direct mapping. Alternatively, if you can compute with the physics of these devices, that's much more efficient because now you have compact implementations of these neuron and synaptic building blocks which can inherently be operated at very low voltages. Now on the left hand side here, I'm showing you the typical characteristics which are very popular as a spiking neuron computing model which is characterized by the leaky integrate fire equation. Now the term V here is the membrane potential of the spiking neuron and the capacitance C is associated with integrating the incoming spikes and you have a leak term. Temporally if you look at the variation of the membrane potential you have incoming spike trains coming into your neuron the membrane potential integrates incoming spikes and leaks whenever you do not have a spike. And whenever the membrane potential crosses a particular threshold, the membrane potential gets reset and you generate an outgoing spike. Now on the other hand, let us try to consider the magnetization dynamics of a magnetic tunnel junction and in particular, if you look at the temporal dynamics, they are described by the landau lifshitz gilbert equation which I am showing you here. And the term M denotes the magnetization dynamics of the nanomagnet. And if you try to look at the resemblance between the two equations, you will actually see that there is an inherently a leak term associated here along with an integration term at the extreme right. And this shows temporal dynamics of a magnetic tunnel junction device in response to a set of five incoming current pulses. And if you actually see the magnetization profile, it integrates and leaks whenever you do not have any pulse. And if you try to compare pictorially the two characteristics, you see a drastic resemblance between the two. So the key contribution and key takeaway here is the fact that you can inherently have these nanomagnetic devices which perform computations similar to what is present in the biological neurons and synapses that we have in the brain. And this was one particular example to show you a leaky integrate fire switching characteristics. Now note the fact that we have a magnetic tunnel junction like the one that I showed previously and inherently the magnetization dynamics that we have in the free layer of this magnetic tunnel junction is characterized by the magnetization dynamics that I am showing you here. Now given the fact that you already have an inherent thermal noise during the switching process which is shown here, there is an inherent stochasticity during the switching. And if you consider this device to be interfaced with peripheral circuits that try to write the device and read the device in the subsequent phase, in the leaky integrate fire characteristics that I talked about previously along with the thermal noise that I am showing you here along with such decoupled read and write phases can be utilized to abstract the functionalities as that of a stochastic spiking neuron that I am showing you here. In essence, we are plotting here the switching probability of the magnet as a function of the current pulse magnitude that we have. And if you look at the variation, it's non-linear and it has a sigmoid variation that of the, which is similar to sigmoid functionality that you typically use in neurons. Now note the fact that when you are trying to have neuromorphic computing platforms based on the spiking neural networks, people typically use two types which are either deterministic or stochastic. And if you think of deterministic neural transfer functions in the spiking domain, people typically use leaky integrate fire. However, there is a huge amount of study in the computational neuroscience field where people have talked about the fact that computation in the brain is inherently stochastic and is characterized by stochastic neuron synapses and dendrites. And there is a good amount of literature to abstract spiking neuron functionalities where every time step the probability of spiking of a particular neuron is a nonlinear function of the input that it is receiving. However, the neuromorphic community has been mainly focused till now on the deterministic uh, spiking neuron functionalities and to some extent that has been also driven by the fact that the underlying hardware we have been trying to implement it in CMOS technology has been deterministic. Now given the fact that now we have nano devices which are characterized by inherent stochasticity 
and you can scale down these magnets to aggressive dimensions and you can leverage the enhanced stochasticity that you will have in these aggressively scaled dimensions it does make sense to look at stochastic computing paradigms where you have scaled nanomagnets implementing these neuron and synaptic functionalities now just to give you a overview of how you can read the stochastic outputs from these nanomagnets this is the same device that I was talking about previously where you have a heavy metal layer and you have a nanomagnet lying on top of it. Now we can interface that with a reference magnetic tunnel junction layer which we are not writing and the state of this reference MTJ is always fixed to one particular state. So if you think of it during the write phase if you pass a current through the heavy metal layer that will end up switching the magnetization of the nanomagnet lying on top probabilistically and during the subsequent read phase you can activate the read terminal and the read current will flow through the resistive divider stack and that will end up switching the inverter and if you try to tap the output switching probability of this inverter as a function of the right current here you can get a stochastic sigmoid variation like the one I'm showing you here. Now this particular decoupled write and read phase is more valid for high barrier height magnets where you can have data retention capabilities. But now when you are trying to scale down these devices to very low barrier heights to of the orders of less than 5 kT it enters a telegraphic switching regime where the data retention time is very low. So in those cases the read circuit has to be activated all the time because you do not have data retention capability and because you have the read and write terminals activated all the time first of all you need very, sen very he heavily optimized read circuit design in order to make sure that the read current flowing through the resistive divider does not bias the switching probability of your magnet. So it's a very constrained design space and it's a very sensitive device operation because the um, nanomagnet can switch at very low current. So this is actually showing for a very um, low barrier height magnet and as you can see the switching probability switches from 0 to 1 just within minus 1 to plus 1 microamps. So first of all it's very sensitive to, uh, to device variations to other noise that you may have in your neuromorphic computing platform. Additionally is the fact that because you can have switching at such low currents you need to properly design the resistive divider circuits for reading. So that's an important design concern that you have for low barrier height magnets. Now so far I have mainly talked about neuron functionalities. Now let us try to address synaptic operations and how you can perform learning in these synapses. So whenever you have a neural network you have different inputs coming in to a particular neuron through synaptic weights and this is one particular example where you have synaptic weights W1, W2 and W3 and in a sense they encode the importance weights of various inputs that are coming into your neuron. Now in spiking neural networks unsupervised learning techniques based on spike timing dependent plasticity has been actively looked at and they're actually based on measurements made by Bai and Pu and it's a seminal work where they tried to measure the synaptic plasticity changes in response to the spike timing difference that you have between the transmitting neuron and the receiving neuron. So here when I am having a set of transmitting neurons I1, I2, I3 which are pre neurons transmitting to a receiving neuron O1 here which I am terming here as a post neuron then depending on the timing difference of spikes being propagated out of the pre-neurons and post-neurons you have different plasticity changes. The positive half of the graph here corresponds to the portion where your post-neuron fires 
after your pre-neuron. And in essence, that is a temporal correlation effect because since your post-neuron is firing after your pre-neuron, then probably the post-neuron is temporally correlated to your pre-neuron. So the assumption is that the synaptic weight change should be positive here, which is corresponding to the positive half of the graph. Now in contrast for the negative half of the graph, the post-neuron fires after the pre-neuron. So you have a temporal decorrelation effect. That is the, since the post-neuron is firing after, so probably it's not temporally correlated to your pre-neuron. So we should decrease the synaptic strength joining the two neurons. And if, and this is just showing one particular example where we have typical firing patterns of the pre-neurons and we have the post-neuron O1 here. And we are having different temporal delays, T1, T2, T3, that I am showing you here, and that is pointed out in this graph as well. So for neurons, for example, I1 and I2, which are spiking before O1, the synaptic weight change is positive, and it's much more for T1 because it's much more temporally correlated to O1, whereas it's much higher for T2, so the synaptic weight change is much lower. In contrast, for I3 that we have here, the synaptic weight change is negative. So this is in general the synaptic plasticity scheme that people typically look at for implementing unsupervised learning in spiking neural networks. Now that was more of a spike timing dependent plasticity for multi-bit synapses. Now the nanomagnetic devices that we are talking about here are single bit devices. So how do we implement the multi-bit spike timing dependent plasticity? One way to think of it is, can we implement the multi-bit functionality in the probabilistic switching of a single bit element? So to give you an intuitive feel, if you are operating and you want a 50% synaptic plasticity state change, you can think of it like a 50% switching probability for a single bit device. Now what is the advantage that we are getting out of it? We can have very compact implementations. You can have aggressively scaled devices, single bit elements. So you have state compressed networks or binary networks where you are encoding the multi-bit information over time in the probabilistic switching of the device. So that's the key advantage that we are having for the stochastic synaptic platforms and learning. And a very simple way to do that would be you have the stochastic spike timing dependent plasticity curve that you have here. You have, you know the switching probability of the magnet as a function of the right current. So it's very intuitive to now infer what would be your right current as a function of the spike timing. And it turns out that if you are really trying to operate at this low switching probability regime, which you need for synaptic learning, the variation of the right current as a function of spike timing difference needs to be linear. Now, how do we implement that in a stochastic synapse? So this is a bit cell showing the implementation of spike timing dependent plasticity in a stochastic synapse. So the control signal post that we have is for right operations. And the four transistors that you see here surrounding the device are just for access. Note the fact that we have a decoupled write and read current path. So the red line here denotes the write current. The blue line denotes the read current that is flowing through the device. And the decoupled write and read current paths are actually very important from the point of view that we are trying to implement on-chip learning. So it's very efficient from the perspective that you can now optimize your read and write peripheral circuits independently. So that's a crucial advantage that we have in these three terminal device stacks. Now, post is the control signal that we are using for write operation. So whenever you have the post neuron firing, we activate the post control signal in the device. So now when let's assume the fact that the neuron is not firing. So the post signal is deactivated. So we have the read current path activated. Spike trains can come in through the magnetic tunnel junction stack and get modulated by the synaptic strength and pass on to the post neuron circuit that we have here. 
Now what happens during the write phase? So that is enabled by the post control signal that we have here. We have the access transistors and we additionally have a programming transistor MSTDP and that is driven by a linearly increasing gate voltage and if you operate this transistor in saturation it's possible to show that the right current that will actually flow through this device will be linear as a function of the temporal delay of spiking of pre-neuron and post-neuron. So this is how you can implement spike timing dependent plasticity in these spintronic synapses. You can now arrange these spintronic devices in a crossbar array fashion that I am showing you here with the peripheral transistors and the access transistors. Note the fact that two of the access transistors here can be actually shared by different rows of the array. So this is the final structure of the array architecture that we are using for synaptic learning. And as I mentioned, some of the advantages that we have are decoupled write and read current paths along with the fact that the energy consumption that you have in these spintronic devices are, are inherently much lower than other emerging devices like phase change memory synapses for example. This is actually one particular example of synaptic learning in an array of 400 neurons. We used a spiking neural network and we tried to implement spike timing dependent plasticity in a stochastic fashion in this neural network. Each of the subcomponents of this picture actually represent the synaptic weights for one particular neuron. And as you can see, after some learning epochs, you have representative patterns being formed in the synaptic weights. And we are using this for digit recognition problems. So you see representative digits being formed in the synaptic weights here. Now, going forward, I will be discussing some of the recent work on using stochastic spike timing dependent plasticity in these networks. So I previously talked about STDP where your synaptic weight change varies as a function of the spike timing difference. Now, I showed exponential variation, but for the time being, let's assume you have a simplified version where you have a constant state change as a function of the spike timing difference. Now what we are trying to explore, so these two halves would then correspond to the standard STDP that I was talking about previously. It turns out that if you can use an additional um, portion of the STDP curve where you have zero state change as a function of spike timing difference and after some point of time you have negative state change that helps in your recognition and intuitively if you think of it why that is happening is because of when your delay between firing of your pre-neuron and post-neuron is very high, then this assumes that you should not increase the synaptic weight because that's a significant delay. Instead, you should reduce it and that we are terming here as anti-Habian depression. So we are using an anti-Habian depression window which improves the efficiency of learning in addition to the Habian potentiation and depression windows. Along with that, we are also exploring quantized 2-bit synaptic networks. So initially, I was talking about just a single bit. We are trying to explore whether having multi-level synaptic states helps in the learning process. So if you see here, we have similarly classified it into Habian potentiation and anti-Habian depression, but now we are representing multi-level states, we are representing by two states and you have different states 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1 and 0, 0 in the potentiation part of the graph. So let's try to see how incorporating such quantized states and Habian and anti-Habian learning mechanisms helps in the learning process. So the graph represents classification accuracy as a function of the number of neurons in the network. So it turns out when your network is resource constrained, you have small number of neurons. Then having such two-bit synapses, quantized networks with such Habian and anti-Habian depression helps in improving the average recognition accuracy. And these are results for digit recognition and 
we see a 3.1% improvement in the accuracy. On the other hand, when you are having high networks because of the enhanced network capacity, the recognition accuracies do not vary that much. It's more or less similar in comparison to the two learning schemes. So the key takeaway is having quantized states would help you when you are operating in resource constrained environments where your network topologies have fewer number of neurons, for example. Now, in addition to shallow networks, we have also trying, been trying to explore whether we can extend the stochastic learning in these Wintronic synapses to deeper networks. And to that effect, we have some results on multi-layered uh, deep networks, which I'm showing you here on the MNIST data set. And as you can see, this is for a two-layer convolutional network, where this is for a three-layer convolutional network. And really scaling these stochastic learning frameworks and having appropriate algorithmic frameworks to train such multi-layered networks is itself a significant challenge. So we are trying to improve on that front as well. On the other hand, so the slide that I talked about previously was talking about just the stochastic learning. So now can we have stochastic synapses, single bit, interface with stochastic neurons which are performing probabilistic inference. And just to reiterate the fact, stochastic synapses give you the advantage of state compressed crossbar array implementations for synaptic scaling operations. On the other hand, if you think of the neurons, you can have scaled nanomagnetic devices operating at very low terminal voltages by these magnetic tunnel junction stacks and you can operate all these synaptic crossbar arrays at very low terminal voltages because you have such low operating currents. So that's the key two advantages that we have for synapses and neurons when you are trying to think of stochastic binary neural networks. And here we are actually trying to train standard sigmoid uh, neural networks by back propagation and you can actually have a resemblance when you train a standard sigmoid non-spiking network you can actually transfer the learned weights to a stochastically spiking network with almost similar recognition accuracy. So once we have trained the network with a standard non-spiking sigmoid function, we use those synaptic weights, we replace the neural inference units in the network with single bit neuron elements which are transmitting spikes probabilistically as a function of time. And leveraging recent efforts at utilizing backpropagation for training binary neural networks. You can actually train such all spin binary stochastic neural networks performing stochastic inference for competitive and to give competitive accuracies on uh, standard data sets like CIFAR for example and these are results showing you graphs from CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 data set. And again, just to clarify the network architecture that we are trying to use, these are crossbar arrays of spintronic synapses driving magnetometallic spin neurons at very low terminal voltages. And the key functionality we are exploiting here is the stochastic switching probability as a function of the right current. Now, so far, I have mainly focused on higher barrier height magnets and I really have not addressed what are the challenges that we face when we are trying to scale down these magnets to very low barrier heights. Now the key motivation behind going for scaled nanomagnets would of course be the fact that you have much compact representations, your operating voltages and currents are much lower. So you have much more energy efficient implementations. And these are switching characteristics shown here for a 1 kT magnet. And as you can see, in contrast to the previous switching characteristics that I was showing you previously, these magnets operate in telegraphic switching regime. They spontaneously switch between the parallel and anti-parallel states. However, you can still bias the magnet to produce a biased random output bit stream. For example, here, this shows a one microamp current passing through the device. And as you can see, that it is significantly biased for switching at one particular state. 
whereas if you have zero right current it switches randomly so you have a 50 percent switching probability here so from the application perspective if you really think of it the core computing element is still the same you are still trying to utilize a bias random number generator where the switching probability varies as a function of the right current but interesting design considerations need to be considered when you are trying to think of the hardware so previously we were talking about higher barrier height magnets we were having a synchronous architecture that i was showing you here where you have decoupled right and read current pulses and then you reset the magnet after you have operated these two phases and that is for higher barrier height magnets because you have higher data retention capabilities now when you are going to low barrier height magnets where in magnetic barrier height regimes like 1kt you do not have that much data retention capabilities and as i mentioned you need to operate these networks then where your read and write ports are activated all the time so you can think of these networks as asynchronous networks where you have incoming spikes coming in from the previous layer neurons and they get directly propagated along the column to these neurons at the end so you do not have such decoupled write and read current phases so that's the key difference and as i mentioned that these devices are very sensitive to the magnitude of write current so they will be very sensitive to external noise peripheral magnetic fields that you might have from other magnets etc additionally you need to design these resistive divider circuits very efficiently it's a constrained design space so that the read current is very minimal so these are considerations that you need to have in place and this is a particular study that we tried to do for higher barrier height magnets which i'm terming here as synchronous networks and lower barrier height magnets which are the asynchronous networks so for higher barrier height magnets they are relatively less error prone this is one particular case where you vary the supply voltage in the circuit and we are trying to measure the recognition accuracy that you have in the network as you can see for the higher barrier height magnet the accuracy almost does not change however when you are considering lower barrier height magnets like 1 kt and 2 kt for example the accuracy degradation is pretty significant almost greater than 5 percent so and it is worth noting here that neural networks are inherently error resilient so the fact that you are seeing such a huge degradation is in classification accuracy means that the core computation that is happening in the network is very much error prone so that's the key takeaway here even for dimension variations as you can see here you do have significant degradations in the classification accuracy so the key takeaway is although you might have had might have advantages from scaling perspective for these super paramagnetic devices yet you need to make sure that your circuits are operated in current fashion like asynchronous uh, networks and also that these may be more error prone in comparison to higher barrier height magnets even if you consider for example the speed of operation of these networks in intuitively you would think that these networks since the neuron elements are switching so fast the speed would be inherently much faster than you would have in synchronous networks for example however because you need to interface these super paramagnetic devices with cmos peripherals to read out the magnet state they would be inherently limited by the parasitic capacitances that would have so we actually did a case study for MNIST digit recognition and we saw that the speed of recognition might be actually comparable or even higher in comparison to synchronous networks. So you might inherently also lose out on the speed advantage that you have in these super paramagnetic devices. Now so far I have mainly talked about um, neuromorphic computing platforms. It turns out that this stochastic switching can be also useful in other non-Boolean computational paradigms where you can sort of inherently leverage the stochasticity in, in, inherently present in these devices 
for escaping local minima for example and in essence I'll be talking about combinatorial optimization problems so I'll now focus on the right hand side part of the computational paradigms now in combination in combinatorial optimization problems one particular model that is very popular is that of the icing computing model and if you really think of the icing computing model you can map the problem to a set of spins that i am showing you here and each of these spins is connected to its nearest neighbors and it turns out that if you can map a particular combinatorial optimization problem to this 2d array of spins they will be described by this hamiltonian that i am showing you here and if you let the spin states stabilize to the lowest energy state that can in a sense give you the solution to the combinatorial optimization problem that we are considering now two of the core functionalities that we need for implementation of these icing computing models are first of all coupling with the neighbors that i am showing you here so each spin state if you consider that each spin state we are representing by one of the stochastic spintronic devices that i was talking about previously so you have an up state and you have a down state now depending on whether majority of your neighbors are up or down you update the next state of the spintronic device now you can do that though if you just rely on that you can get stuck in local minima so this is one particular energy landscape that i am showing you here so now in order to escape that local minima people typically use annealing however note the fact since we have stochasticity inherently in these devices you can utilize that stochasticity to have a natural annealer in this case so that's the key computing paradigm that we are trying to explore where we are trying to use both the coupling with the neighbors and the stochasticity inherently in the devices so if you now see one particular implementation of the spin that i am talking about here you have the spintronic device here and these are receiving signals from the four nearest neighbors so depending on whether the neighbors are high or down you get a corresponding current flowing through the heavy metal layer so that's implementing the majority function now how about the natural annealing process so you can think of this being naturally implemented because of the stochastic switching higher the current coming in from the signals from the neighbors higher will be your switching probability that you are trying to consider so we have these two core functionalities implemented directly in this device and this is one particular application that we are showing for graph coloring and we have different examples for different vertices and edges that we have and different types of solutions that we obtained from the icing solver based on the nanomagnets that we have and you can use these sort of computing paradigms for other forms of problems like traveling salesman problem for example now to give you a feel of how we are trying to explore these computing platforms we are trying to have a cross layer design effort where we are trying to have frameworks to model these spintronic devices we are trying to model the device physics and we are trying to see how you can use that inherently for implementing various neuron and device characteristics now from the device level you need to arrange these devices in array fashion to implement these neuromorphic circuits so then we go from devices to the circuits phase and finally you need to have appropriate in memory computing architectures in place to implement these neuromorphic computing platforms so it's really a cross layer design effort going all the way from devices to circuit systems architectures and algorithms so i would really like to wrap up my talk here as i tried to highlight the inherent stochasticity in these spintronic devices can be useful not only for looking at newer forms of neuromorphic computing like the stochastic computing models that are talked about which are inherently more brain like in addition to that you can potentially use that for other forms of computing paradigms 
like Ising computing, Bayesian inference, and SAT solvers as an example. I would like to conclude my talk here and thank you for your attention. Thanks.